Hey, Aaron Rabinowitz here for Red Giant TV. In our recent film, Tempo, directed by Seth Worley, there were a bunch of sequences that included gunfire and ricochet or bullet hit sparks. So in this episode of Red Giant TV, Harry Frank will show you how to create realistic sparks and bullet holes, as well as revisiting a recent tutorial on creating muzzle flashes. Fire away, Harry! Hi folks, Harry Frank from Red Giant here, and in this tutorial I'm going to go through some of the effects on this shot right here. This is one of the shots from the short film Tempo from Red Giant, and we've got, uh, well, we've got some gunshots, bullet holes, and sparks where the bullets hit the metal of the air duct up there. Now, there are a lot of great libraries out there that allow you to simply drop footage in once you've got perhaps your tracking and any rotoscoping done. Uh, Action Essentials is definitely one. In fact, in the Tempo film, we used Action Essentials from Video Copilot quite a bit. But not everybody has these libraries on hand, and even if you have the libraries on hand, sometimes you start to use the same ones over and over, and it helps to have a bit of variety. So I've actually redone this scene using materials that are constructed on the fly in After Effects um, and one little Photoshop thing that we'll do, creating the bullet hole. But mostly our focus is going to be using After Effects, using the uh, 3D camera tracker in After Effects, and trap code particular to create the bullet sparks that hit the metal as well as the muzzle flash that comes out of the gun itself and I've actually done a full tutorial on that but we'll do a little refresher course on that and all of the stuff will be available as a free download on Red Giant People. So first let's start with the plate this is our footage right here and I'm going to drop this into a new composition and here is our starting point. I'm going to brighten this up just a little bit So before I start designing any sparks or flashes or anything like that, I'd like to get the shot tracked. So I'm going to select this clip, go to Animation, and say Track Camera. And this is going to use the new 3D Camera Tracker in After Effects. Now, because I've applied this Levels effect, it's going to tell me that it ignores any effects applied to it and just looks at the source footage, which is just fine. That's exactly what we want. So it's going to analyze in the background, look at the motion of the scene, and solve the camera in 3D space. Okay, so now it's done analyzing and solving, and what I want to do is convert these points in space to null objects in 3D space. To work in 3D space in After Effects, I need a camera, so I'm going to go to my camera tracker, create my camera, and now I can start going to these points and creating null objects. Now, there's a couple things I can do. I can go to the individual point and create a null, or I can find three of these, like this one right here, when we have three of these, we actually have a resulting plane that has an angle. So I could go inside there and right click and select Create Null. Now, what that's going to do is give us a null that's actually fairly well aligned to the surface of that, uh, that air duct. We don't necessarily need that, but it is good to have. So if I can find a number of those, that would be great. But I don't think we're going to find all of those that align exactly with where the gunshots uh, go off. Now, as far as I remember, there are five gunshots in here. So I have to find all these uh, different points that align with where the gunshots go off. So I don't know if I'm going to find enough points to create these all at the exact right angle, but we'll have to get as close as we can. So this one is probably good for this angle right here, so let's create another null object. So we've got one shot there and another shot that are kind of in the same area. So one in, one at the very beginning and two slightly further up. So maybe we'll put one right in here, kind of where that shadow of the pipe is. So let's create a null object there. I'm going to stagger these just a little bit so I know what order I'm going in as well. This is going to be one of the last ones here. So let's move along. One, two, three. And let's see, it's pointing right over here. Let's create a null right there. This one's kind of pointing over in this direction right over here. Create that null right there. I'm 
and slash shot. Let's see if this one kind of makes sense with that. Yeah. That's probably good for that one. Should be five shots all together. One, two, three, four, five. So if I kind of scrub through this with these selected, that's pretty close. So first I'm going to put the sparks and bullet holes up in the vent up here, and then we'll go back and we'll do the muzzle flash for the gun. So let's start with the sparks. I'm going to use trap code particular and then use these points in space to generate the sparks. And what I'm going to do is put light emitters in each of these points so I can have the sparks emit in that exact space. Okay, so now I'm going to create an After Effects light that I can use for my sparks. To do this, I'm going to rename the light emitter. I'm going to use a spotlight. And I want this to be aligned where the null objects are. So an easy way to do this in CS6 is to simply use your parenting pick whip, target the object you want it to be aligned to, and hold down the shift key and it's going to snap right to that point. If you don't have CS6, uh, just parent it and then go into your position and type 0, 0, 0 for X, Y, and Z. That's basically the same thing. Now for what I'm going to do here, I'm going to hold down uh, Option Command O or Alt Control O in Windows and uh, pull up the auto orientation and turn off the, the uh, point of interest. And this makes it really easy to just take the whole light and rotate it in the right angle that you want. So I kind of want this uh, shooting downward. So I'm going to take this one and align it with that uh, that null object right there. And then I'll just uh, create a number of these. So this emitter is going to be parented to that one. Emitter 2 is going to get parented to that null. In fact, I should rename these. Track null 2, track null 3, track null 4, and track null so emitter 3 gets parented to track null 3. Let's duplicate that. That'll be emitter 4. And duplicate that one more time and line it up with that. I'm holding down shift, just so you know. As you drag along around a layer, it will snap to the various layers that are also in the comp. So that's a good way to get this perfectly aligned. Just hold down shift so that will snap right to it. Get that aligned. Now I think all of these are still in the original position but they are parented. So if I look at all these, they should have all different positions. But if I zero out the X, Y, and Z for each of these, in fact, if I select them all at the same time, I should be able to zero those out and they should all be aligned where those uh, null objects are. So if I play through this, I just want to sort of double check that the lights seem to lock onto the track as well as make sense where the points in space are in relation to the gunshots. Now these lights are going to get a little distracting as we start to add objects in here. So I'm going to go up here to the top of my comp window and go to view options and select spotlight wireframes off. We'll still have our points where the lights are, but those distracting wireframes will go away, which I think is just fine. Okay, so let's finally get to some particle work in here. So I'm going to create a layer called Sparks, and we'll apply trap code particular to this. So in my effects and presets here, I can simply drag trap code particular on there. In my emitter section here, I'll change the emitter type to lights. And let's turn up the velocity and particle size, just so we can see that lights are emitting particles. Now, there's a couple ways that we can go about this. I'll show you a way that I did it because I just thought this was a little bit of an easier way rather than dealing with keyframes. But you could certainly keyframe all of these lights to turn on and off. In fact, if you go to the light intensity itself under light options, you can keyframe the light intensity from 100% from the beginning down to 0%. And what that is going to do is essentially act as a throttle for the, for the light that is emitting particles. In fact, it's going to emit particles beforehand because even though the light isn't 
technically on at this point in, in uh, the composition, it's still set to 100%. So this actually needs to go from 0 to 100 back to 0. Another way we can do this is by dropping an expression in here. And I find this easy just because I'm familiar with expressions, but if you're not, then keyframes might just be the way to go. But I'm going to use linear. Linear allows me to output a series of values. So I can output a value that goes from 100 to 0 that starts and ends at specific times. So when I use linear, I specify my rate of change. What is guiding this linear relationship of keyframes. So basically I'm creating a linear set of keyframes that start at one value and end at one value. That rate is going to be time. It could be, well, anything, but I'm going to use time. Time is a very easy way. So I could say something like time uh, 0 comma 1 comma 100 comma 0. And what this is going to do is be equivalent to a set of linear keyframes that go from 0 seconds to 1 second. And have a value that start at 100 and go to 0. Now I don't want 0 second and 1 second, I want the starting point of my layer and I want the starting point of the layer plus 1 uh, frame length. So I can use the word in point with a capital P to define the in point in time where my layer starts. And I can use in point again as my end point plus the time it takes for one frame to pass, which is a little bit longer. This comp period frame duration, capital D. Now I'm going to have the same problem that I had before, which is that it's going to be emitting before the light. Let me get rid of this parenting column here. So what I can do is add one little check in here. I can say if our current point in time is before the starting point, don't emit any particles. So I can simply say if time, that's our current point in time, is less than the end point. If that case is true, it's going to do the first thing it sees after the parentheses. It's going to output zero. If that case is not true, else I can have it follow what happens afterwards. So now you can see it's 0 goes from 100 down to 0. Now I don't have any keyframes to shift around or anything like that. All I need to do is enter this expression. So if I select this intensity I can say copy expression only, select all my other emitters, and paste. Now these light emitters should only be emitting where the endpoint is, plus one frame. So now I only have one particle layer to, uh, to worry about. All of these light emitters are connected to one particle emitter, and this is still probably really small for what you're seeing, so I'm just going to turn these up, and let's push this velocity, the particle velocity, which is how quickly they are moving at the time they're born. Let's just push that up a little higher to 2,000. So you can see what's going on here. We have a little burst of particles at each point of the lights. Now because I'm using the lights to control the particle emission, I have one layer where I can control how many uh, well particles or sparks that we see. So let's set this to a high number. Let's say 2,000 particles. Now these are sparks from gunfire bullets move very 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 fast so this velocity is actually going to need to be extremely fast and the particle lifespan of three seconds is going to be quite long for this in fact we'll set this to something like 0.1 seconds now we're getting there now let me direct you to one handy little feature here in the emitter section uh, under emission extras, there's a new checkbox here called Lights Unique Seeds. And what this is going to do is use a random seed or a random set of values for each set of particles that emit from a light. So what's cool about that 
is that we're not going to have the same cluster of particles for every single light. Right now they're identical. It actually doesn't really look that bad. If we look closely at the distribution of particles here and there, we kind of see we have like this one off here at about 3 o'clock. And that kind of is the same for each, uh, for each light emitter. So if I check this checkbox, like unique lights, unique seeds, these are all going to be random now, which is pretty cool. So this is essentially equivalent to having five different pieces of stock footage that we can throw on here, adjust their color and their angle in 3D space. Pretty cool, huh? So let's get into uh, adjusting the color here. This is certainly something you need to do. So I'm going to do kind of a spark uh, orange, and let's turn this particle size way down because, well, we're dealing with sparks here. We don't need something huge. Let's set this to maybe 50. Now I'm just emitting single particles right in here. Sparks have a very sort of streaky kind of look. Now I could work with motion blur to try to get this to work, but an easier way to do this is to drop down to the aux system and use the aux system in particular to draw these streaks. So let's go down to the aux system here and let's zoom in on this set of particles. Now the aux system, if you're not familiar with it or need a refresher, the aux system turns every single particle we have into a particle emitter itself. So I can say emit continuously, so this is going to emit from each particle continuously. So we're not seeing a whole lot just yet. I'm going to push this particle count up to say 200 particles per second, and I'm also going to bump the size up to let's say 30. I'll go to the size over life and use this one right here so they have a bit of a uh, diminishing size. And the particle life also. I'm going to set that to a very low value. I'm going to set this to maybe like 0 0.05. Now these have a kind of a green funny color to them because the default color map is right here, color over life, and it uses this map right here. Now we can tell these to inherit the color from the original particle right here by using color from main, which defaults to zero, so I'll turn that up to 100. Now everything is a nice solid orange. Now we see this sort of speckled kind of look because we have 200 particles per second, and we have very fast particles, so if I increase this particles per second we'll start to see these uh, gaps fill in and uh, have a bit more uh, something that looks like a spark. I'm going to go back to the main particle itself and turn up the size random so these aren't all the same size and turn the size down just a little bit. And this actually could be more on the white side of things. Particle uh, Sparks are not kind of a glowing orange, but almost more white hot. And let's add just a little bit of color random in there. Now as you can see, the particles are emitting in all different directions. I never went back to the em emitter section, and in here I can guide the direction of the particles. Right now they're uniformly emitting, so actually emitting upward, downward, and all that kind of stuff. We have a bullet hitting a surface. We have a flat surface that these all should be shooting away from. So I should have these moving in a specific direction. And when I use a light, I can actually tell it to uh, use the angle of the light. So I could have it look fairly directional like this, or I can turn up the cone angle so it's almost uh, 180 degrees, which uh, it could be. So I'll use that value right there. 142 seems to be pretty good. I'll select these others and just paste that value in there. So now for each of these, I should have an identical set of sparks coming off of here. They still look like they're going a little bit slow. So let's go back here, let's set this velocity to 20,000. So that's the main particle that's guiding the aux particles. Not too bad getting close. They do live for quite a bit of time. So let's go back to the particle 
life right here in the main particle. I'll turn this down to 0.5. And right now these are moving in a perfectly straight line, which isn't very realistic. There should be a little bit of random motion going on here. So let's go into the physics section and start to mess up the paths of these particles just a little bit. So I'll go to physics, air, and I have a couple options here. I don't think there's going to be a tremendous difference between using either of them, but I'll explain them both. We have a uh, spin frequency that makes the particles spin on a path uh, along their movement, along the path of their movement. So they sort of move on a sinusoidal uh, path along their motion path. And we have turbulence, which kind of randomizes the, the path. We're only seeing these for about one or two frames. So I don't think there's gonna be a tremendous amount of difference between either of these, but they both have a little bit of a quirk that you need to make sure you change if you want to use either of these. If I'm going to use spin frequency and I turn up this spin amplitude to have a little bit of spin on their path, I could crank this spin amplitude up and the spin frequency up and I'm really not going to see anything. The reason is particular defaults to a value of one second for the fade in spin. And the same goes for turbulence. If I twirl this, uh, fade in time for turbulence. This basically means that it takes one full second of the particle life before any of this takes effect. So any of these error effects have a one second delay before they start doing anything. So I'm going to want to set that to zero before I see anything. So this amplitude now is just a little bit high and starting to push these a little too far out of their path. I can turn this frequency up so we have a very sharp frequency. Now you can see these sort of shooting in all different directions. The color is a little bit flat right now, so I think we can go in and start adjusting color. So the transfer mode of the aux particles is set to normal. I'll set, I'll set that to add. So what we've got is the internal blending mode of the aux particles as they mix with each other, as well as the main particle. So I'll go up to particle, set color, or I'm not, sorry, to transfer mode, and also set that to add. And that's basically going to be the, the tips of the, the sparks. Again, now this is going to be set for all of these. So if I go in and watch through this, it seems to be doing pretty well. They are pretty sharp, and they're off in the distance. Now, to my knowledge, Camera Tracker defaults to having the depth of field off. So let's go into our 3D Camera Tracker and look at our depth of field settings. I'll turn that on, and I'll adjust the focus distance so that these start to blur out just a little bit. And maybe they're a little thick at this point, so let me cue up one of these. With that blur, I think we can take the size down just a little bit of the aux system as well as the main particles. Now if it looks a little too thick, like there's too many particles, I can start to thin that out a little bit. So you can see that this number is the main particle. So this is basically the the density of the cluster of particles, or how many streaks of particles we have in there. Down here in the aux system, this is the thickness of that trail of particles. So if I turn that down, that will start to thin it out down there. Now, when I looked at the original, I noticed that uh, what was used in here, this, the stock footage that was used, was sort of a, a firecracker kind of thing. And although it looks like Close to this, there's a little bit of a flash right at the center that happens, sort of a cloudy flash, the, the initial burst or explosion. And, uh, you know, we maybe you're fine with how these uh, look right now, but I can add one more burst in there. In fact, we've got all the burst and everything, the short life span, the emitter, the directional, all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to take this whole layer here, the sparks layer, and Command or Control D to duplicate it, and we'll call this the burst. It's a kind of little cloud burst or explosion. Let's solo that. And let's not look at a white background. So composition settings, uh, command or control K, just so you know. Uh, let's take this velocity down very low compared to where we have right now, 100. So we should just end up with a little burst. 
I'll expand the emitter size out quite a bit. In fact, there's no reason for us to have the um, aux system on. So let's turn that off. Let's turn up the size, maybe lower the opacity. In fact, instead of using a sphere, maybe we can use a cloudlet. Get a little bit more of a cloudy, fractally kind of look. There, and maybe I'll take the opacity down just a bit. Where is my opacity? It's right here. Now, if I got my opacity fairly low, and it's still pretty uh, dense, that tells me that I've got too many particles per second here. So let me turn that down a little bit, and maybe turn my opacity capacity back up. The reason I want to do that is because more particles per second equals more rendering. So if it doesn't make any difference one way or the other, I would opt for fewer particles. There. I think that's looking pretty good. Maybe we want a, just a slightly different color with the that burst. You know, we could go a little crazy with some blue or maybe push this orange a little bit more towards towards a red. Now, uh, I don't have these blending together at all. In fact, the footage, or the I should say the sparks, are not blending at all with anything. I'll take this burst and go to the blending mode here and set this to screen. Set the sparks also to screen in to look a little, a little bit better, match with the scene. Okay, so I mentioned we're going to be doing the bullet holes as well. So I'm going to hop over to Photoshop and create a, a bullet hole for us to work with. My dimensions are going to be square. And uh, we'll hit OK and bring this down just a little bit. Let's bring up my layers here and create a new layer. Let's just delete that background layer. So I'm going to go to the lasso tool and just draw out an irregular shape. And I'll take that and I'll fill this with, well actually um, I don't even need to fill it with a color. I can just go to filter, render, clouds. Look, there we go. Now I create another layer and I'm going to create uh, a circle. I'm just going to use my elliptical marquee. I know I could use a shape. I guess I could use a shape, but this is old school Photoshop in here. So uh, I've hold down Shift and Alt. I can constrain this from the center. And this is basically going to be the size of the bullet hole. So I'll fill that up right there. And I'm going to fill that with black. So good keys to know if you don't do enough Photoshopping. If I select some crazy colors for my foreground and background. D resets your foreground and background colors to black and white. X swaps those back and forth. X swaps foreground and background layer. So if you're going to be using luminance maps and doing texture uh, maps and you know creating bump maps or anything like that, you're basically going to be working in black and white and you're going to be swapping back and forth between black and white. It's a good thing to know. So uh, I want to fill this with black so I'm going to hit X to switch that back and I'm going to hold down Alt Delete to fill that layer with uh, black. Now what I'm going to do, right click on this and say convert this to smart object and go to filter Gaussian blur. Now the reason I set that to a, a smart object is because the Gaussian blur now ends up being a non-destructive filter, a smart filter basically. So I can go back and make adjustments to this if I see uh, fit. So this is going to be the bullet hole. I'm going to make a duplicate of this and just drag it down to the new layer and blur this one quite a bit. Now the reason I'm doing this is because I'm essentially creating a bump map. The bump map is going to use the luminance values that you see to create the illusion of height or depth. So this is the bullet hole. This one right here is going to be sort of a indentation around where the bullet hole will, will exist. I'm going to create one more layer. And let's go to my paintbrush, left bracket to lower the size down a little bit. And I'm going to make a little bit of a hot spot over here. And I'll use my eraser tool to kind of fade this back a little bit. I just want a little bit of an irregular sort of uh, raised bump right here. 
as if the bullet didn't hit it straight on, but it's going to be raised up a little bit right here. So now I want to take this and turn this into something that has sort of a bumpy lighting kind of effect. Of effect. Now I need to get all of these things merged together. So what I'm going to do is select them all, just select the top one, hold down shift, select the bottom one, drag these all into a new folder, and I'm going to right click on this folder and say convert that to smart object. So now this is essentially one object, but if I want to go in here and edit it, I can still double click on it and go back and it'll show me the uh, the group, uh, the PSB, which is the I don't know why it's a B, but it's a group of um, layers that go together to make this one layer right here. So to this layer, I'm going to go to Filter, Render, Lighting, Effects. So if I drag these little handles around here, I can adjust the scale width, the, uh, well, I can move it around, and I can move the hot spot around as well. Now you can see that little raised bump area, which uh, kind of works, but I might need to soften that a little bit, so it's a good thing I can go back and adjust that. Um, also, if uh, you're just seeing this right now, uh, this might be, this is probably saving my settings from before, my texture section right down here, my texture channel can be red green or blue. You're probably not going to see a tremendous difference between any of these, so I'll just leave this set at red. And then take the height and pull the height up or down, however you see fit. I'm going to pull it up. Now because I applied this to a smart layer, I can hit OK up here to apply that effect. But again, that is going to be applied as a smart filter as well. So I can go in here, look at these side by side. So here's my final bullet hole. Here is my group. And let's say I take this one and I soften this a little bit more by using my eraser. In fact, I'm going to take the opacity of the eraser down below a half and just kind of soften that down a little bit and you can see it updating in there. There, pretty good. Now if you want you can add a little bit more texture by throwing a grunge texture on here. These are some grunge textures that I've recently shot. So I could take that and just drop it on top hold down Alt or Option in between these two layers and set a clipping path for the texture so it's only showing up where the uh, the layer is below it. And I'll set this to some sort of brilliant blending mode to get this texture to blend in with everything else. There. So let me locate that in my finder. I'm going to drag bullet hole in as footage, merge all the layers together and put this in my composition, make this a 3D layer, and and I need to bring my parenting column back in. So let's set this to parent, set this to right there. Now I've got all these lights in here, all these light emitters. Um, now I've got a fair number of light effects already kind of painted on here. So essentially I'm going to take this Go to my material options by tapping AA and turn off accepts lights. Now it does look a little contrasty to me. I might go in here and flatten out this a little bit. So I'm gonna use a white paintbrush and kind of smooth it out just a little bit. Oh, it looks like when I painted that white, I didn't restrict it to the area of the texture. So let's go back in here. This is the white that I painted. And hold down Command or Control to load that selection. Go in here and mask that out and save. Now, so we need to do a little bit of color correction. First, I'm going to just add a basic mask on top of this and bring the mask in to kind of fade this in with the rest of the texture surrounding the bullet hole. So I'll drop in the mask and then hit uh, F to show my mask feather. 
and kind of fade this in. But more importantly, let's get the color to match. So I'm going to go to Color Correction, Curves, and it looks like we got a little bit of green out there. So I'm going to go to my green channel and push that up just a little bit. And also match the darkness of the hole so that it tends to blend in and fit the scene. Okay, so we're getting there. I'm going to scale the bullet hole out just a bit, but the actual hole itself I think could be a bit smaller, so I'll go into that group and take this main hole right here and hit Command-T to apply it. It's just going to tell me that's disabling the filters for now, the Gaussian blur, and then I'll come back. This one right here, same thing, Command-T, it's going to say, yep, we're turning off the filters for a second. I'll bring that down. So I just want to make the bullet hole itself a little bit smaller relative to the whole area because it doesn't quite seem realistic what we've got right now. All right, so we got some brighter sections in there that don't quite seem to be fitting in. So I'm going to drag these curves down just a little bit to darken those brighter areas. That seems to be fitting in. Now let's go back into that green channel. I'm going to push this up just a little bit more so it matches. And just to experiment, I'm going to see if adding any blue helps. Maybe just a touch. There we go. So I think that's pretty good. Still looks a little bit sharp to me because we have scaled it down and all that kind of stuff. So let's take out some of that detail simply by adding uh, some camera lens blur on that. So I'll turn that up. So from here, it's uh, well, it's kind of a matter of getting a correct relative scale in terms of what the size of the bullet hole and the dent and all that should be. So I can go up here, select this comp, and create a uh, new viewer. Now, one of these I can show the handles for, but the other one, notice that they have their uh, own set of view options. So for this other one, I can just turn the layer handles off and look at the composite there and see the handles in this one. So now I can scale this down as I see fit. Maybe I want to ease up on that mask just a little bit. There we go. So now I just need to make a number of duplicates of this. There's five gunshots, one, two, three, four, five. And each of these will parent to the appropriate null. And I'm going to just hold down shift, but know that if you don't have that option, just zero out the position after you parent it. So bullet hole one, two, three, and four. So basically I want to get each bullet hole aligned in time with the, the null. Now it looks like the angles are not entirely aligned with where we need them to be to get these where they need to go. This one right here is a little bit in shadow, so I might take this and try a different blending mode like soft light or even hard light. And I think soft light actually works pretty well with that one. Now there's one big thing missing here, which is the muzzle flash. Now this tutorial is starting to run a little bit long. If I go through this muzzle flash in detail, it's going to take me another 10 or 12 minutes. Fortunately, I've already done that in, a new, in another tutorial where I've covered the idea of muzzle flashes quite extensively. In fact, we've done it twice before. And those muzzle flashes are available as a free download on Red Giant People. There's not much different than what we've done here versus what we've done with the sparks. We've got a, a flash of uh, light, a sort of a cloudy light, as well as some sparks that shoot in a direction using an emitter. So I've got a light emitter here, and I actually have two layers of particular. I have the muzzle flash and the sparks that are actually laid on top of each other on one layer, just to keep things simple. The muzzle flash uses the light emitters. The particles are set to cloudlet. Very, very similar stuff to what you just saw me do with the sparks. 
So there's nothing wrong with just downloading the preset and using it as is. Now this does work in 3D space. You've got this 3D emitter and all that kind of stuff. In a scene like this though, I think it might be just as easy to go in and take the pre-comp itself and just drop it in. So let's do this one right here. So let's align this all the way down here at the bottom with the first shot. Let's see, tracker one and the bullet hole. Let's get rid of, uh, let's get rid of that one right there. I tap I to go right to the beginning of this one. Here we, here it is. So that's where it should be firing. Actually, it looks like this all should be dragged back one frame. Because it should fire, and then there should be a reaction. So right there is where we should have the muzzle flash. Let me turn that layer back on. Now this muzzle flash takes actually one frame to get going, so we need to push it uh, basically one frame ahead. And we don't need this to be in 3D space or anything like that. I'm simply going to take this and kind of squeeze it and align the angle to what's going on in here. So let's take this and squeeze it down just a little bit. You want to go the extra step of putting the light emitter and dropping those layers in to get this truly in 3D space. Uh, you can. I think this is actually a much easier way of going about it. I just want to squash it a little bit uh, disproportionately to give a little bit of that angle to what's going on here. So take that and repeat it for each gunshot. And uh, there's actually a few different variations in here with different random seeds and different uh, fractal influence on the, the particles. So there you go. Do-it-yourself effects using trap code particular and a little bit of Photoshop. I think it's great to have these tools in your bag of tricks so that when the day arises where you just don't have the right footage or you don't have any footage at all, reach for trap code particular and create your own visual effects. My name is Harry Frank. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks, Harry. If you enjoyed this tutorial, check out Harry's site at graymachine.com where you can find a whole bunch of awesome goodies, including free presets, tutorials, and a link to Harry's fantastic training DVDs like Complete Training for Trap Code Particular or Trap Code Form Training. Also, don't forget to check out Harry's killer Red Giant Guru preset packs, looping backgrounds for Trap Code Suite, cinematic flares for No Light Factory, video rock for Particular, weddings for Trap Code Suite, and holidays for Particular. Because, hey, it's always that most wonderful time of the year. And by the way, you can get all of those and much more as a part of the Red Giant Guru Suite. Don't forget, you can download a free trial version of the software that Harry used in this tutorial at RedGiantSoftware.com. And you can get free presets for Red Giant plugins on RedGiantPeople.com. And to keep up with the latest news about new products, tutorials, tips, and deals, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or on our blog. Once again... I'm Aaron Rabinowitz for RedGiantTV.com. I'll see you next time.